God, we just thank you so much for this time. We can come together, God, and I just pray that this night, and um, while we're here and while we leave, God, that, that we would just fall more in love with you in whatever way that looks like for us tonight, Lord. Um, that we would see the way that you have made us and the way that you love us. Um, and that would just give us so much joy from such a deep place, Lord. We love you and we give you this time, Lord. Thank you for worship and thank you that we get to talk to you in this time. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys have a seat. If you're in middle school, feel free to head out. They got some fun planned for you. I have a couple things I want to tell you guys real quick. I think we have a little slide. But the first thing is, if you are at all interested in going to Mexico, today is the day to turn in your papers, get your deposit in. And if you don't have it today, but you really, really want to go, you might still take some later. But um, the spots are filling up, so definitely try to get that in as soon as possible. For those of you who are going to Mexico, we are having a team meeting on February 3rd at 10 a.m., which is a Sunday. It's actually Super Bowl Sunday. Um, so at 10 a.m. at Kickstand, if you're going, if you know you want to go, come so that you can hang out and kind of get all the details for what's going to happen. Um, the other thing I just wanted to let you guys know is we do have a website. We've had it for a while, flagstaffcommons.com. You can listen to um, the podcast, the videos. You can see our calendar to see events that are going on. And we also um, have online giving, which is another thing that's on there. That was kind of broken for a while, and now it's fixed. So if that's your thing, make sure you check that out because it's up and running. And just so you know, Super Bowl Sunday is two weeks from today, which is very exciting. And we are not going to have service because it's like an American holiday, right? So February 3rd, um, don't come here, but we will have some party options. So... Make sure you grab one of these. There's two different locations where you can come hang out with us, eat food, watch the game. Um, we can just be together and get to know each other more. So that'll be fun. Or if you have something else going on with friends, just make sure you get together because it's a great opportunity to do that. So here comes Charlie. Here comes Charlie. <laughs> hey, we are glad you're here if you're visiting. Uh, we have a tradition of praying for another church town and today we're going to pray for uh, uh, Mount Calvary Lutheran Church over there off 180. Uh, they've got a new building and a great pastor we just want to lift them up that they are uh, I think it's maybe a renovated building but uh, a lot of great people meet over there. Let's pray for them our time together. God thank you so much um, for Mount Calvary. God thank you for the years that the school was such an influence in this community. God thank you um, for them as a body and what you're doing there. God I just pray that you um, Fill them with your spirit, your presence, and your joy. Um, we love them very much, God, and we thank you for them and the influence they have this time. We just ask you to help them to grow and be made new and help us to stand side by side as we try our best, broken as we are, to shine our light together, your light, uh, to this town. We love you and pray that as we open the word today that you bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know you already know I'm going to talk about football, but I was out in the foyer, foyer, whatever you prefer, and I had a really awesome conversation because I was talking to uh, I was talking to Jill and I was talking to Adam Castro. We were talking about football, and Jill actually threatened me that if I talked about football, she would go to sleep. She actually brought a coffee, knowing that that was going to happen. And Adam, the joy of my heart, not Jill, had a great idea. <laughs> he had an idea that next year, instead of having a mission trip to Mexico, what if we just went to the Super Bowl? <laughs> what do you guys think about that? I mean, who's Who's reaching out to those people and building relationships, <laughs> crossing the gaps? I think that's a great idea, so I love Adam with all my heart. A um, couple of thoughts for you. One, I'm glad that a lot of people aren't here because they're watching National uh, the Championship Sunday, uh, which is some, means that those are my people, which means you aren't my people, but we're going to make it through this anyway. Um, and I don't fully mean that. I, I'm so glad that we get to share this time together. But I, I wanted to share something today that happened in the life of one of my children, Colt. If, if you're not a parent, you may not understand as much, so just forgive me about that. So this last, I guess it was two weeks ago, Colt had a, an annual uh, checkup with a pediatrician. And I know you won't understand this if you're not a parent, but when you take kids to their annual checkup, there's some sort of like apprehension and competitiveness that rises up in you, because at these checkups, you find out all sorts of information about how your kid stacks up against other children. And really, what else is there in parenting than how your kid stacks up against other children? I, I can't think of anything. So I get really nervous when I go to these things. Mark actually took hold to this one because they give you all sorts of information the size of their head compared to other children. I mean, that's something to get nervous about. 
and it's always been kind of funny for our family because we have four children and every time we go to these checkups we get the same results all four children who i think all look unique and different as their dad they are all the exact same they're all about the seventh percentile in height which means there's 93 percent of the population taller than them um, the seventh percentile in weight probably seventh percentile intellectual ability. I don't know if they measure all that, but then it gets to their head and they're like the 98th percentile. I've got all these like orange on a toothpick kids. And it's, uh, it's kind of painful as a dad, but I think it's because they're really brilliant. Um, but, but Colt goes in and it's a little different because Colt's six years old. So this is not just about measuring your size of your head or your height. I mean, this is big time. Um, the pediatrician is going to be asking you the real deal. Like, can you read? And uh, do you know what colors are in math? And Colt was killing it. So proud. I mean, there, I mean, he's just slamming. Two plus two. And he's like, four is that? Are you serious? That's what you're going to ask me? Two plus two? A kindergartner. Um, and he goes to Montessori and he gets a great education. So that was just a joke for him. And, and so they, they progressed farther. And he did really great math. And the pediatrician was wowed at all his intellectual prowess. And he, he read some things from the pages. And Marco was there. She was proud. But then they tested his vision. And you have to understand genetically that his mother is blind. I mean, legally blind, just wear giant, huge spectacles, which is not wearing contacts. So we're, we had concern that our children might fall in that same genetic pathway. And so when it came to the big vision test, Cole had to stand there and he had to look at the letters on the wall, the charts, you know, and you got the big E, you know, you're familiar with the lines all the way down. And so they started on the fourth or fifth line or something like that. And they said, okay, Cole, can you read the fifth line? And he's squinting and, you know, just squinting as hard as he can. He goes, no, not at all. And uh, that's not a big deal, you know, the fifth line's pretty intense. They said, we're about the fourth line above it, can you read that one? And he's like, no, I can't, not at all. And so the pediatrician kind of looked at Mark and like, Ugh. and so they said, what about the, the first line? You see the E, right? He's like, yeah, I see that one. And like, can you read the third line, like the big goofy letters anybody should read? And he said, I, I really, I can't. He's, Mark said he started getting nervous and kind of sweating, and Cole's kind of shy, and that's one of the things I love about him. He was just like, oh, he's getting terrified. Marcus said, well, babe, can you just try? Can you just do your best to read it? And he goes, I, I guess. And he said, bazook would do this? <laughs> <laughs> he, he could actually see all the lines, but he thought he had to read them like the, like the previous test. And I thought that was pretty awesome. <laughs> like, oh, okay, actually he could read the, all the lines. And once he figured out that he had to just go letter by letter, and I thought, man, there are so many analogies in that. I'm gonna have to write that down. I'm gonna use it. For, for years to come. And today I'm not going to use a really great analogy for that, but we are going to talk a little bit about vision. Now, if you haven't been with us, uh, we started a new discussion last week. In fact, we revived or resurrected an old discussion that we had a couple years ago um, called the Dead Poet Society is what we call this discussion. And the reason is, if you heard last week, we showed a clip from the movie Dead Poet Society where Robin Williams, who's John Keating, this professor at the prestigious Welton Academy, I'm not going to show the clip again, but he, he brings his students out to the foyer and he, foyer, whatever you want to say, and he looks through the glass at the old faces and he's trying to impress on his students that these long gone alumni, these students that have gone before him, speak through time to them. And he tells them to carpe diem and make their lives extraordinary, kind of creepy whispering to them. But the idea is we want to take some time to think about those people within the Christian faith who have gone before us. Those people whose voices hopefully also echo through time that we can learn from. It's not just the contemporary world. We're not controlled ultimately just by the culture and the newest things. We have 2,000 years of incredible history of people who have tried hard to follow Christ. And so each week during this discussion, we're going to look at someone or some group of someone's and try to hear their voice pass through time. Now, I had a huge curveball today because I was all excited this morning about sharing with you somebody who had a lot of vision. And I thought it'd be appropriate with tomorrow to share a lot about Martin Luther King. Um, and if you don't know a lot about Martin Luther King, you should. He's an incredible historical figure. We're not going to talk about him today. I got a curveball coming. Um, but he was first and foremost a pastor. And his passion for being a pastor actually even supersedes. In fact, if you go to his Wikipedia page, just Google Martin Luther King, you'll see one of the very first quotes is him saying that above all else, I'm just a pastor, more than just trying to be some sort of great civil rights movement, which he was. And, and I, I often wonder, I was even thinking about sharing how impactful thinking about this old civil rights movement for some of us in the 60s uh, in America and the South, how relevant it even is in Flagstaff, Arizona in modern day, the day that we inaugurate again, an African-American president. I thought, how interesting is it how far the country has come and, and the influence of Martin Luther King? But I really wasn't comfortable with this one thing. 
And I want to point this out because one of the things I love about the commons and the freedom we have here is we're a little bit loosey-goosey. We don't go to our death or die on the hill of tertiary theological issues. Um, a lot of different Christians throughout times have had a lot of different ideas about what I call tertiary theological issues. But the more I dove into the life of Martin Luther King, who was incredible and we should learn from and we should celebrate because of his vision of the unity and the equality of mankind, the more I realized that he did not share in common one of our non-negotiables. The, the few things we hold in our left hand is that he fell, unfortunately, into this trap of early textual criticism science in the early 60s. And he was convinced by what we now know was bad evidence, but at the time was the cutting edge evidence. He was convinced that the deity of Christ, the idea that Jesus was God in the flesh, was something that developed later after the authors of the New Testament. And he actually did not believe that Jesus was God squeezed into a human body. And so for me, I came to a point of going, oh, I want to talk about this guy. And I don't want to devalue the incredible things that he's done. But I don't think he shares in common one of the things that I would go to my death over and the things that we do know now from better textual criticism that Jesus did make it very clear that he was God. And so I thought of, where am I going to go? Your earlier day, what are we going to do? And I came to church, and as I was just walking around, Kyle, worship Kyle, said, hey, why don't you talk about John Newton? We're going to be doing a John Newton hymn today. And those of you who don't know, John Newton um, is the composer of the arguably most famous hymn of all time, which would be... Amazing Grace, right? It's actually not the original name of it, but in America, Amazing Grace. And he does have an incredible story, and he is very much connected to the idea of vision, and I thought, that's a perfect substitute today. Now, again, I don't want to devalue what we're celebrating tomorrow. It's incredible what Martin Luther King as a visionary did, but I wanted to look at someone who desperately understood the truth of what a difference Jesus makes in their life. Let me tell you a little bit about John Newton. Let me give you a little bit of a background. Now, John Newton grew up um, not a Christian at all. He was born in 1725. Um, and this is going to be a little bit different because last week, those of you who aren't into science might not have enjoyed the theme of, of Kepler being an astronomer, but hopefully you heard the truth of what his life ultimate testimony was. And you're going to see John Newton is in, in a very different vein than the sciences. He ultimately was a poet, which is ironic since we're talking about the Dead Poet Society. But he grew up nothing more than a basic sailor. In fact, he grew up in a time of much religious confusion. There was still a lot of drama between Catholicism and Protestantism. He had a semi-Catholic dad. He had a semi-Protestant mom who died when he was seven. But by the time he went to boarding school and was raised, he had completely abandoned his faith. In fact, we know a lot about him. There's a lot of biographies and chronicles of his entire life. But he became a sailor at a very young age. He went on six or seven voyages with his dad, who was also a sailor, a merchant trader on the Mediterranean. He traveled around a lot on boats, and he got exposed to this modern philosophy of the day. There was this uh, duke in England who wrote basically an, an atheistic piece to convince people to join the atheistic, materialistic worldview. It's interesting to me because, by the way, I don't know if you know this, that's a very modern thing right now. There is a neo-atheist movement of what I would call evangelical atheists, the Christopher Hitchens and, and Richard Dawkins of the world, who are putting forth philosophy to show how deism or the belief in God is the enemy. Well, he fell into this even in the 1700s, the same vein of thinking with these other sailors. He also became a profane and infamously horrible person. In fact, we know from reading the, the annals of the different journeys that he was on, he was often beaten by other sailors. He used to write mock poetry of every captain he was with. They would try to starve him to death, and eventually he was forced into the Royal Navy. They actually kicked him out of the Navy he was forced into and made him be a slave on the coast of Africa because no one wanted him. In fact, no one liked him, and most of all, and this is what I really want you to hear, John Newton didn't like him. He hated himself. There are his own biographies he describes early in his teenage years after losing his mother, after losing his faith and all these voyages and eventually getting involved in voyages that were the slave trade, moving slaves back and forth to England and to the Americas. He wanted to kill himself. It was like he wrote multiple essays on the justification of why he hated himself and why he should die. Now, where does Christ come into the story? Where are we going to take this? Now, he has a very famous conversion story. In about 1748, he was on a voyage, uh, and he was going back to England in a huge tempest or, or a giant squall, which I love because it's so common to the Sea of Galilee. When we look at the story of Jesus' day, these horrible storms come, and horrible storms 
comes on, a joy, uh, on one of his voyages. He went back to England, and he was deathly afraid. And the ship actually began to sink. Water was coming in, and cargo actually slipped over and lodged itself in the hole, just enough to keep the ship afloat to get him to England. And in the process of this multiple-day voyage, he decided that he wanted to put his faith in Christ. He remembered some things from his multi-religious background, but he ultimately decided that at this moment, in this trying, dramatic moment, he was going to give his life to Christ. In fact, as he reflects later in 1779, he writes the great, uh, the great hymn, Amazing Grace, which was originally uh, titled Faith, uh, The Faith Review and Its Expectancy, which is a terrible title. I'm glad America took over and got that fixed. Um, but here's the thing, and this is what I want you to hear. We're going to look at two things, because the whole idea of Dead Poet Society is to try to take a stab at what would these people communicate if they were here? What would they share with us? Now, his life became incredible because, interestingly enough, he didn't leave the slave trade after he met Christ. In fact, years later, he would say there was a second greater conversion in his life, five years after his original conversion, where he really understood God's love. Even though he himself had been a beaten slave in Africa, he continued for seven years to be a part of shipping maybe up to 20,000 slaves in one of the worst human conditions and one of the worst travesties of humanity of all time. He began to slowly convert out of that, and then seven years later, he finally came to a breaking point and said, I cannot do this any longer, and he dove headfirst into his new great passion of theology. He studied under every great thinker of the day. He applied to be ordained in every denomination he could possibly find because he didn't care about the denomination. He just wanted to share about Christ. And ultimately, he had an incredible career after running into other poets that came to his congregation, writing hymns. In fact, he was a profound hymn writer. In fact, later on in the service today, we're going to sing a different hymn of his that is not Amazing Grace, but tells also the story of the tempest in his life. But I often think of the line in Amazing Grace... I think if there's one thing from the life of John Newton, I remember, it would be the line, I was blind, but now I see. Now, where does that come from? Anybody? Don't shout it out. Be awkward. John 9. This is straight out of the Bible. And I think that he would probably communicate this story. But what I'm going to do today is we're going to take a brief look, a very brief look at John 9, the story of the healing of blind man, where he takes that phrase exactly from the Gospel of John. And I want to look at another story that's similar to it and hopefully try to communicate what John Newton might share from his incredible life. So let's go to John chapter 9. And I'm going to just paraphrase most of this because this story of the healing of this blind man is the entire chapter of John 9. And it is well worth reading the entire thing. In fact, I think when you look at the snippets of the four Gospels, all three synoptic Gospels and John, I think if you look at each little story, they're so snippety and fragmented. And for some reason, this, this one, the elder John, dear friend of Jesus, wrote an entire chapter with every detail of this healing because it had such an impact on him. So I would encourage you later to go read all of John 9. But here's the summation of it. Verse 1, he says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. This person was born this way. It says that his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And this is a great theological question. Jewish thinkers of the day mistakenly believed that you could sin in the womb and God would punish you by being burnt, born with a birth defect. Jesus says, I love it, you won't put up with that kind of bad theology. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And then later on in verse 6, I don't think we have this up there. This is how he actually heals him. He says, having said this, he spit on the ground. He made some mud with saliva and put it on the man's eyes. So weird. Don't understand Jesus. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And this word means sin. So the man went and washed and came home seen. There's a lot of drama that unfolds after this. And I love a couple things that we're not going to read through, but I love that this man's life was so incredibly changed by being able to see that he was no longer recognizable to the people around him. They said, I think, I think that's the same guy. But he's so different after encountering Jesus, we don't really know. The Pharisees, the religious people of the day, were furious at Jesus' healing. And here's what happens when they're questioning the blind man again in verse 24. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know that this man is a sinner. And he's talk, they're talking about Jesus. And I love his response. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. There's the line. 
And there's the incredible story from the elder John telling us that when the, the religious forces of the day are trying to get into theological things and trying to figure out all the tertiary stuff of who Jesus is and why he's behaving, the blind man gave in one sentence the greatest apologetic of the Christian faith in all of history. And I want to say that again. Apologetics is the defense of the faith. And it's something that I'm really nerdy about. I love studying textual criticism, the original languages and science. I love seeing how much intellectual backing we have in our faith in who Jesus is. But none of that compares to the simple sentence of this blind man. He says, all I know is I was blind, but now I see. And throughout 2,000 years of church history, there's never been a more impactful apologetic for the Christian faith of that. Lives changed because they encountered Jesus. And that's what happened there. Now here's what I want to do today. Here's the thing that's interesting about John Newton's life. I'm fascinated by, and so are a lot of scholars that look at his life, I'm fascinated by the fact that when he had this moment, when he had this conversion experience, he could see Jesus. Things were open for him, like the line in Amazing Grace. But he still was a part of the slave trade for seven more years. In fact, it wasn't another 30 or 40 years, 30 or 40 years before he became, and this is part of the beautiful part of his story, one of the strongest voices against slavery. He had someone named William Wilberforce in his congregation that probably was the greatest voice for the abolition of slavery under the banner of Christianity, saying that Jesus would never look at humans on an equal level. No human could own another human. In fact, John Newton got to see the abolition of slavery passed in England before he died. But many scholars say if he met Jesus and it was such a big deal, how come he still participated in it in so long? So what I want to do is I want to look at one more story that I think Newton might share that might be more personal to him that's very similar. This is in Mark chapter 8. I think you'll see similarities between the two stories. Also, the healing of the blind man. John Mark, probably the first to write his gospel down, says this in verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Now, I want to stop there because I think it's amazing that it, here's another picture. There's so many of these in these eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus where people bring their broken or blind or hurting friends to Jesus. That, by the way, is a picture of community. That, by the way, is part of what we're supposed to do when we fall in love with Jesus. Figure out how we can bring people to Jesus. It wasn't the blind man who wanted to be healed. They dragged him there and they asked Jesus to touch him. And here again, the strange thing. He took the blind man by the hand. He led him outside of the village. And when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? Verse 24, he looked up and said, I see people and they look like trees walking around. 25, once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes and then his eyes were opened and his, eye, his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly and Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. Now this is a very, very, very unique story in all the four eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. It's only recorded here in Mark and almost every commentator of the Gospels spends a large amount of time commenting on the strangeness of this story. Some call it the two-stage healing. It makes not a lot of sense. It's almost as if maybe Jesus made a mistake. He didn't get it right. Didn't have enough pixie dust. The healing didn't go all the way through. And he sees trees. I don't know how many of you have been with us for a long time in the Commons. We've actually visited this before under a very different context. One idea about what's happening here I think has some truth in it. And that's actually what I shared about before. One way of interpreting this strange story is that the first time Jesus opened this guy's eyes... He let him see things in the spiritual unseen realm. And there's some theological ideas that support this. In the Psalms, and in fact throughout the whole Pentateuch and the Jewish scriptures, there's this idea that the human soul is like a tree, like a tree planted by steady waters. And there's this idea that maybe this is the way of a Jewish writer saying he could actually see the unseen world first, the real world that we can't Touch. In fact, Martin Luther King has a beautiful, beautiful sermon about the third dimension of the unseen and how important that is in all of our lives. And then Jesus opened his fleshly eyes to see as we all do. That could be the truth and source of what John Mark wanted to communicate. But as I'm thinking about John Newton, and I'm thinking about him communicating to us today, echoing through time, I wonder if this story didn't resonate more with his life in a very real sense. Because we know that he had kind of a two-stage healing. He had a great revelation where he decided, I can't go on in this complete blind lostness of there is no God, I'm doing whatever makes me feel good. In that moment in the storm, he had a moment of life entering him. His eyes 
were open. And yet we have to ask historically, why did his life not change dramatically? How could he still, after meeting Jesus, be a part of the slave trade for so long? I think he would resonate with the idea that the thing that makes grace amazing is that it is more than a one-time event. One of the things that concerns me about kind of American Christianity and the way that it has evolved in the last hundred years is this idea that Christianity is all about one moment in your life that is everything. This conversion moment. You're horrible and you're lost and worthless and you find out God loves you. You say a magic sinner's prayer and then boom, you're into some sort of platonic heaven and you don't have to worry anything the rest of your life. That's not Christianity. Now, is there a moment, a starting point, like a marriage where we give our life to Christ? Yes, that's wonderful. But that's just like a marriage. It's day one of a marriage, a life that grows and changes and learns. And when I look at John Newton, I'm amazed, not critically, at how he missed what was going on in slavery for seven years. But when I look at the span of his life, that he figured it out. The more he fell in love with Jesus, the more he studied God's word, the more he started to recognize the darkness of who he was, listen to this, as a Christian. See, there are many people in this room who are following Christ at various points. It's one of the things I love about the commons. It's such a hodgepodge of people with different stories. But all of us are in the same boat. We all need amazing grace. So here's the so what. Here's the questions for us. First of all, a question for the general crowd today. Have you seen the light the first time? Are you, like John Newton, still lost and clueless and have no idea that you can have free access to a beginning point of a marriage with Jesus? And if that's you, it's so easy to know how unconditionally loved you are. And to know, just like John Newton, who was pretty much the worst possible person you could be, hated himself, hated other people's, tried everything he could to offend God, he was instantly accepted into God's unconditional love. That's true for all of us. But the second question for those of us that are trying to follow Jesus, maybe for a long time, maybe for a short time, is what is it in your life that you might be missing? What is it that if a biographer looked at the span of your life and they could look in at this one moment, they would say, how is it possible that they've met Christ and yet they still are wrestling with this inconsistency? I find it ironic that there are people out there I, I know who would, who would look at this life and, and this slavery issue that's so obvious to us in the modern mind, who are struggling at pornography at home, judging him, clicking through the internet, supporting financially with every click a modern day slavery of girls who are put into using their bodies in a devastating way. It's well documented, the horrors of the pornographic industry. I wonder how many of us if we could look at a biographical stretch of our life, would say at this point, if you look back, how did I not yet figure out that money and materials are not the source of joy for my life? They are not the significance of who I am. And so I'm really asking a challenging, uh, a difficult question, even for me. I hate to think of the own answers in my own life. Um, the pride, the self-importance, the lust, the things that I still to this day cannot conquer, but here is the thing that I want you to hear above all else, so we need to hear it. There is amazing grace. It wasn't just one time that we are forgiven from the horrors of who we are. There is a recurring theme in Christianity that I don't want you to miss, of renewal and resurrection. You see, what John Newton found out about following Christ is that Christianity is not a religion like the Pharisees were trying to put forth. It is a recreation of human beings. We can be made renewed in the image of God that we talked about last week with Kepler. We can be made completely new. And it is a process. It is like the growing of a tree. And today, as we come to communion, we get to celebrate the amazing grace that he became so famous for pinning. But as we come to this table today and we remember the blood and the body of Christ, as we always do, I want to challenge you with that question. As you take the blood and the body, the crackers and the wine, the grape juice, I want you to reflect in your own heart, if you're a follower of Christ, and say, what are the things that you have not let go of, that you know has not yet been renewed and recreated within you yet? And take that to Jesus, because that's why his body was broken. That's why his blood was shed, so that we could have grace, 
forgiveness and be renewed. As soon as we're done with communion, if you haven't been here before, we have four stations. Feel free as they sing this song to go to either of the, any of those as a follower of Christ. The song they're going to sing is a, is a secular song. And in the chorus, the message is one of redemption and renewal. And I love that they have redeemed this secular song and its lyrics about how we are to be recreated. Let's pray for this time together. God, thank you. Um, thank you that a troubled, suicidal, self-loathing teenager who is very much like us um, responded to your heavy pursuit of love for him. God, in his life, it came in the middle of a storm, and God, in our lives, we have all sorts of different kinds of storm, but I pray that we will know that there is hope to move from blindness to sight and vision. And God, I pray for those of us that long ago have found your great love. God, help us see the areas where we still see fuzzy. God, where we still need your healing touch. I believe we will always need another touch from you, Jesus. Help us to have our eyes opened. And I pray a huge prayer, God. God, I pray that so many in this family, in this room, will live extraordinary lives that bring you glory and light. God, that people will look in someday at my life and theirs, all of us together, and see the mess that we are, but in all of that, see the amazing grace of your love and how that transforms us and makes us new. We remember you in this communion. Love you in Jesus' name.
they are, because um, I think they're amazing and they gift us a lot, um, and I see God in that. Um, last week with Kepler, I didn't want to show you a picture of him until after, or I didn't want to taint you, so I kind of had the same thing with Newton. Here's a picture of what he looked like on rendering. This is John Newton. I think he kind of looks like Kyle also. <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much the same thing there. But here's a, here's a cool thing. Uh, I got to do, I, a lot of you know, I told you about it last time, but I'm in the middle of three different... Uh, times of going down to Arizona State University and sitting on this religion panel. And I get to discuss with this whole audience um, with a, a Muslim friend and a Jewish friend and a, and a Buddhist priest. And we get to discuss our different perspectives on religion. And I went down again this Thursday a couple days ago. And it was amazing because this time they had a theme to our panel. And the theme of the panel was forgiveness. And I got to tell you, I felt going in there like I was in a good boat to be in a Christian theology. Um, it's something that is key to who Jesus was. It's key to what we celebrate in, celebrate in Christianity. It's forgiveness. In fact, it, it almost hurt me to hear my friend Rabbi Ronnie telling that crowd that forgiveness can only be earned by you. You have to earn it back from God. It's only in your actions can you be good enough to make up for your mistakes because that's not Christianity. Forgiveness comes from God. That's what makes grace Amazing, and like Kyle, um, I love how this fell together today. None of this was the plan. I want to read this. I love the last verse of that song that Newton wrote. I want to read it because I don't think I could ever say it better. You guys just sing it. Though afflicted, tempest-tossed, comfortless, a while thou art, do not think thou can be lost. Thou art graven on my heart. This is God talking to us. All thy wastes I will repair. Thou shalt be rebuilt anew. And in thee it shall, shall appear what the God of love can do. That's, that's poetry. That's a gift to hear from the past what Newton shares with us. Let me pray for us so we have a great week together. God, thank you um, for changing Newton's heart. Thank you for changing my heart. Thank you for continually changing our hearts. Thank you that we are graven on your heart that we cannot be lost in your unconditional loving hands. We worship you for that, and God, we pray that the world will see what the God of love can do in the way we live for you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.